So this should be a fun video. All right, um, to preface this, I was on Twitter. Make sure you follow me over at Twitter, at DIY or Dive Vaping. But I'm on Twitter and I see that the American Lung Institute, Institute? The American Lung Association put out a tweet that said, switching to vaping is not quitting smoking. E-cigarettes still produce a number of dangerous chemicals including acetaldehyde, acrylon, and formaldehyde. Looking to quit for good? Get 10% off our proven Freedom From Smoking Plus program. And it led to this link. And I click on the link and I notice, hey, wait a second. The American Lung Association has their own quit smoking campaign. And I was very curious to see what this campaign consisted of. Upon further research, I found that for $100, you can sign up and go through this program and eventually quit smoking. That is kind of how they're phrasing this. Another thing that's interesting is in that specific link is about how they're trying to persuade you not to go to vaping and to use their program instead. And they give you some things about switching to e-cigarettes. For instance, what should I do instead of switching to e-cigarettes? The first thing they recommend, the first thing they recommend is medication. Using quit smoking medications are proven safe and effective such as nicotine gum patches, nasal spray, inhalers, lozenges, and the non-nicotine medications, bupropion, which is Zybin, and Veriniclin, which is Chantix, to help relieve physical symptoms. When you try to quit smoking, with or without Chantix, you may have nicotine withdrawal symptoms. Stop Chantix and get help right away if you have changes in behavior or thinking, aggression, hostility, depressed mood, suicidal thoughts or actions, seizures, new or worse heart or blood vessel problems, sleepwalking, or life-threatening allergic and skin reactions. Decrease alcohol use. Use caution driving or operating machinery. Tell your doctor if you've had mental health problems. The most common side effect is nausea. Quit smoking. Slow turkey. That's the first thing they recommend. You go, you try the gums, you try the patches, you try the sprays, you try the inhalers, you try the lozenges, and if that doesn't work, then before you try vaping, you should get on Chantix or Zyban. And then they ask you to sign up. So I said, wait a second, let me ask Twitter if you guys think it's a good idea that I sign up for this program and I just see what it's about. Let's see what this program does. So right off the bat, the program costs $100. It costs $100 for this program. Now, what exactly does a $100 quit smoking campaign from the American Lung Association consist of? Well, the first thing you need to do, obviously, is sign up for an account which takes down all of your information. They want to, of course, spam your inbox. They're, of course, gonna take all of the information that you provide on this website and, of course, sell it back to these quit smoking medication companies. In fact, it states right here in their privacy policy, we may use or aggregate your non-personal information with the non-personal information of our other users or other non-personal information collected offline. We may use some or all of this information to support our commercial activities, such as for general statistic purposes, site tracking, or for any other purpose. Now they do state, we do not sell or share the information with any other entity for marketing purposes. How many times have we heard that? Things get a little gray in that area. And I also wanna state that the American Lung Association does not create this program. This is a program from the Stay Well Company, LLC. This privacy policy is created by Stay Well. It is not created by the ALA. Now, who is Stay Well, right? What is this Stay Well Company? Why are they working with the ALA? Well, I couldn't find too much information about them. In fact, it looks like one of their employees doesn't even know what the company has done. And if you look at the reviews for working at this company, they're not very good. Good company gone bad. Their company has a lot to figure out. Very unstable. Appears managers are completing the survey to improve stay well image. The most frustrating company I have ever worked for. Very poor leadership. Fake culture, advice to management, replace the CEO. Incredibly frustrating to work here. By the end of my time here, what joy I had in working alongside my peers was squashed daily by questionable decisions. But I did dive in a little bit deeper and it seems they do have some really interesting relationships with health 
care providers. So as I was researching Stay Well, I came across this article that seemed to be taken down. It seems as if they took down this article. Also, the person who wrote this article was the chief science officer who no longer works there. He wrote an article called e-cigarette policymaking should e-cigarette use be a reasonable alternative. And in this article, he discusses how he doesn't quite think so, at least not yet. I believe this was in 2015 and he was just basically making the statement that he wants to see further evidence, specifically from Ken Warner, Dr. Kenneth Warner, who as we know, has come to promote and encourage the use of e-cigarettes to move away from combustible tobacco. It is the first in the Warner series to be moderated by Ken Warner himself, whom I consider this nation's savant on tobacco policy. So if he's the nation savant on e-cigarettes, well then we should probably listen to him. But what I found was that Paul Terry, the chief science officer of this company at the time, was actually writing a guidance for the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine on how to integrate e-cigarettes into their tobacco policy. So when you go and you work somewhere, they always have some sort of tobacco policy. Well, they were now writing guidance on how companies should be treating e-cigarettes. And of course, stay well, creating this anti-smoking campaign they will probably see money in creating anti-e-cigarette campaigns. So having your CSO then put their input in creating guidance on tobacco policy is very interesting. A lot of conflicts of interest. Maybe that's why they removed the article. Maybe that's why he no longer works there. I'm not exactly sure. I don't want to push too hard on that, but there is this interesting relationship between stay well and healthcare providers and, and, and healthcare policy, as well as workplace healthcare policy. It seems as if they're sort of commingled together, which is, you know, it's in the best interest of stay well, but is it in the best interest of the employees who these policies get put on or the best interest of the public health? It just seems this company creates products for employers to send out to their employees in terms of, you know, all, all sorts of health benefits, which is actually a pretty good business. Um, but as we'll see, are they getting their money's worth? Is this program effective? All right, so getting back to the campaign, I signed up, I spent a hundred bucks, I got an email saying, all right, you're in, let's do it. And I'm greeted with a dashboard. And the beginning is basically just a bunch of preliminary questions asking about my history. Then I came across this part where it says that I can get a certificate. Besides recognition for taking this great step forward in your life, the freedom from smoking certificate may be valid as a proof of completion or of quitting smoking for the purpose of reducing your health insurance premium. Check with your employer or insurance company to find out more. That is actually very interesting. If you are able to produce this certificate, you may be able to reduce your health care premium, your health insurance premium. So then I am greeted with this dashboard and this dashboard is filled with these sections on how you should approach this. It seems as if there is some sort of like timed, scheduled plan. I just went through it at my own sort of pace and they also wanted me to track my packs of cigarettes or my, my cigarette usage throughout the day. Nonetheless, I went into section one and uh, it's a lot of reading. It's just a lot of reading about how to navigate certain things that you're going to experience as a former smoker, about your feelings throughout your quitting process, about how certain people might interact with you. There's a lot of talk about cravings and triggers and how to minimize all this stuff. Very similar to like drug addiction uh, therapy or rehabilitation. It kind of just tells you about ways that you can combat certain things that to anyone, any adult is mainly common sense. And then I came across these videos that none of them played. None of the videos worked. I've tried it on different things. None of the videos worked. I have no idea why they really need to fix that. And then at the end of each section, you are granted with everyone's favorite thing, a quiz. And this quizzes you on the previous reading material. So in order to pass the quiz, which you need to do to get the certificate, you need to read all of the material and go through all of these other sectioned quizzes. You have to do all of it and you have to pay attention because these, these quizzes were kind of tough if you were just trying to skim through. 
Now, one thing I want to make clear is that it was very apparent that they wanted you to use these FDA approved methods, but most importantly, they wanted you on some type of medication. They wanted you taking Chantix or Zybin. They implemented a lot of this stuff around taking these drugs in order to go through this program. A lot of their stuff was worded in a way that assumed you were on this medication. In this section here, it says quit smoking medication may double or possibly triple your chances of quitting for good. Throughout this campaign, they demonize just the overall idea of nicotine. So it's interesting to me that when they provided this graph here that I'm gonna show you, it kind of stains the nicotine replacement therapies like the nasal spray or the inhaler or the gums. And it just makes the overall medication more attractive. And they do this, I'm assuming on purpose because the medication doesn't have nicotine in it. The medication acts on brain chemistry to bring about some of the same effects nicotine has on you when you smoke where the other ones, it's clear that they're showing you that this is going to give you nicotine. And to, to any person that understands nicotine, that's not much of a problem. But to someone who doesn't understand nicotine and might see it as this thing that is the reason that smoking is unhealthy, they're probably going to be more persuaded by the medication side of things. I'm not saying it's an effective approach. My grandfather who passed away was able to quit with Chantix. I believe it was Chantix. And I mean, it worked wonders for him. He was a four pack a day smoker, four packs a day. All the man did was sit in his room and smoke. And he was able to quit very, very easily with these uh, medications. That being said, that should be the ultimate final option. He was already an old, old man. His mind is almost at the time where he's going to die, right? He's at this very old age. He is the perfect candidate for something like this that can give him a couple extra years without dying of lung disease. And anyone other than that, I, I, you want to really dissuade them from using any sort of psychoactive medication. There's also something very disingenuous about this program when you look at this graph that shows you about all the side effects that these products have, and you look at the side, the side effects for these quit smoking products, they don't talk about the big issue that is on everyone's mind, which are suicidal thoughts as well as terror, night terrors. Here we can see Chantix only gives you nausea, constipation, gas, vomiting, and changes in dreaming. Not night terrors, not violent nightmares, but just changes in your dreaming, and Zybin just gives you a skin rash. The next night, I nodded off listening to Radiohead's In Rainbows, feeling a little guilty that I paid zero dollars for it. I had a quick blip of a dream. A dark, inky fluid was jolting violently from the corners of my ceiling, zigzagging its way across the walls and wooden floor and jerky sink to the music. It was only a dream though, it seemed more immediate and visceral than my usual fare, which I rarely remember after waking up. The following night, things got even stranger. I fell asleep with Bravo blaring on my TV and dreamed that a red-faced Tim Gunn was pushing me against the wall. But I always thought you were so nice, I said. By night four, my dreams began to take on characteristics of a David Cronenberg movie. Every time I drift off, I dream that an invisible, malevolent entity was emanating from my air conditioner, which seemed to be rattling even more than usual. I'd nap for 20 minutes or so before bolting awake with an involuntary gasp. I had the uneasy sense that I wasn't alone. The most unsettling thing about sleeping on Chantix is that I never felt like I was truly asleep. Some part of me remained on guard. It was more like lucid dreaming, what I thought it might feel like to be hypnotized, and it didn't entirely go away come morning. As I showered, shaved, and scrambled into clothes, I tried to shake a weird, paranoid sense that I had just been physically raped by a household appliance. Nowhere else in this campaign or program does it mention dealing with the side effects of taking Chantix or Zybin. Suicidal thoughts are not an identified side effect on this graph. And it probably has to do with the fact that Chantix and Zybin heavily lobbied against any mention of this. Remember, the FDA removed the black box warning on Pfizer's Chantix, who just so happened to have adopted Scott Gottlieb, the former FDA administrator. It is just mind blowing that they get away with this shit. So going back to the program, what else is there? It's not all bad. You know, dealing with meditation and exercise and uh, keeping track of goals is very important to addiction and it's very important to just a good state of mind. And they do touch on that touch, right? They don't dive deep into it. They touch on it very loosely. 
they touch on it, they just like touch the surface of it and then they give you a fucking quiz and then you move on to the next one. It's not a personalized thing, it's not a personalized plan, it's just very surface level. It's good that they do that, but that is not quite worth $100 in my opinion. That's not quite enough to get someone to quit a lifelong addiction to smoking tobacco. Something so personal and deeply ingrained into their identity that it takes it takes a massive amount of effort to rip them from and to just say, hey, you know, you should hop on a bike, you should record your urges, you should, you know, sit down and, and take a deep breath. That's not quite enough. It wouldn't be enough for me. And essentially, that is it. That is the entire program. I think this is it. Oh yeah, I am now an ex-smoker. Thank the Lord. Okay, okay. All right, 100 bucks. One hour. What am I doing? You get a certificate and you're recommended some drugs. And there's also a really good thing that I think this program offers that is not necessarily just for this program, but it's their forum. And it allows you to engage with other smokers who are trying to quit, which is, I think, one of the most important things about quitting smoking. It's the mo one of the most important things about addiction in general. You want to surround yourself with others who are in the same position as you, who are trying to achieve the same goal. But guess what? The forum, the program, the thing that I think is the most beneficial of this, it, you don't need to be a part of the program. You don't have to spend $100 to use it. Ultimately, I just told you what this program consists of. You can make that decision for yourself. If you don't understand that meditating and exercise is good for you, if you don't understand that drugs and Zybin exist, if you don't understand that you can hop on forums anywhere and talk about quitting smoking, then maybe this is for you, but all of those resources are out there for free and are much better resources in general. So I do want to bring up the contrast in vaping. So for myself personally, myself, Personally, when I started vaping, I almost immediately quit. It, it was almost instant. I was able to never go back to smoking, I would say a couple days into it. From what I remember, as soon as I found that vape, the, the right flavor, the right device, it provided that sort of emulation, it was it for me. I didn't need to go back to smoking. I found a much better way to remove myself from tobacco. But the customization option of vaping is what makes it so personal. It's what allows you to tailor your tobacco cessation to yourself. Everyone has their own personal flavor. Everyone has their own personal draw style. Everyone has their own personal sort of wattage or power delivery. There's also a massive, vibrant, fun, funny, interesting, artistic, creative, community around vaping that you can surround yourself with. Mostly everyone in these communities are ex-smokers, are quitting smoking. So everyone's able to relate to you in that sense as well. That community aspect has helped so many people in this community stay away from tobacco. And at the end of the day, it's the most efficient, most effective, quitting procedure that we have to date. You can get so much more for your $100 if you spend it on vaping and get a much more effective, comprehensive plan from vaping than you can at giving it to the American Lung Association. So I sacrificed 100 bucks so you don't have to. And if you enjoy stuff like this, you wanna see more stuff like this, make sure you head over to my website, diyordivevaping.com. You can support me there. You can also head over to Twitter, at diyordivevaping. You can head over to Instagram, at diyordivevaping. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Keep mixing, much love, peace, peace.